Did you know that in World War II, a B-17 gunner was so valuable to Adolf Hitler that he actually put a cash bounty on his capture? This is the story of how one B-17 crew member risked everything to serve his country, was desperately wanted by the Fuhrer himself, and nearly lost his own life in a brutal mission over Germany. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941, the United States had to try and awaken her war machine to join the war effort as quickly as possible. As things got more organized in the following year, by 1943, the 8th Air Force was established in England and the new B-17 Flying Fortress began to arrive to begin the bombing campaign against Germany. Thousands of young men would be shipped across the Atlantic to join the fight as bomber crews, and they would undoubtedly be in for the fight of their lives. But in the entire Army Air Corps, there was one single gunner that was shipped to England that would have a nearly priceless value to both the United States and even Hitler himself. And as we will see shortly, he would be in the thick of it, mere inches away from being killed. So who was this gunner, and why was a bounty put on his head? Well, this would be none other than the biggest celebrity in America at the time, Clark Gable. And in case you don't know who this is, let me show you. Clark Gable was essentially the most prolific actor in North America and would later be called the King of Hollywood. Before the war even broke out, he had starred in multiple major films, including Saratoga, It Happened One Night, and most famously, Gone with the Wind. He had won multiple Academy Awards and was an international icon. But in January of 1942, tragedy would strike Gable that would change his life forever. Just a few weeks after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, his wife, Carol Lombard, had already joined the war effort and was helping to raise funds for the war by taking part in a bond tour. As she and a group of other American servicemen were on board of a DC-3 Sky Train as part of a tour, the pilot would make a fatal mistake, and the plane crashed near Las Vegas, Nevada, killing all on board. Gable would be devastated, and a few months later, at his wife's wishes, he decided that he should join the war effort. MGM, the giants of Hollywood, however, were reluctant to let him go, and FDR himself even advised against it. Regardless, Gable volunteered for the U.S. Army Air Corps anyway. Fortunately, the commanders of the Air Corps worked with MGM and offered him a special assignment, joining a combat unit in a semi-active role to make a war film about the aviators fighting in England. This would place him far from the bulk of combat, in a cozy bed, and the commanders could pick and choose what combat missions that he went on, if any. Gable himself certainly wanted to fly combat like a regular, but understood that this might be his best opportunity. So he accepted the role and, after completing gunnery training, was shipped to England in the spring of 1943. While this was a nice and safe plan in theory, things would not go quite as expected. When the B-17s first began to fly from England, this new bomber was supposed to be a well-defended aircraft that was able to fend off fighters with ease. After all, it had 11 machine guns to fill the sky with lead. But this plan would be far from reality. The German fighters would not shy away from the B-17 formations, and the results initially were devastating. The American bombers started to take losses at alarming rates, as these early missions took place before fighter escort was in widespread use. For nearly all of 1943, these heavy losses would continue and Clark Gable would be there to see them firsthand. In the early summer, Gable and his photographer began to film and started to collect a great deal of footage for the film back home. But he was itching to go on his first combat mission. Finally, on May 4th of 1943, he was successfully able to hitch a ride on a mission to Antwerp, Belgium. No doubt this was expected to be a relatively safe mission, which is why it was allowed, and the American commanders had not realized just how heavy the losses would be in the coming months. On this first mission, he would join the crew of a B-17 named the Eight Ball and saw them strike their target successfully in Belgium. In this mission, 16 B-17s would take part and 16 made it back home, showing just how small the numbers were during this time. Clark Gable would fire his turret a few rounds at a German fighter or two, 
but none of them ever got close enough to do any real damage. Interestingly, he also got frostbite on this mission as he wore the wrong gloves. Here, we can see Gable with the crew of the 8-Ball on the date of this first mission. For the rest of May and June, he filmed with the crews on the ground until he was finally allowed to go on another mission on July 10th. This would be a raid to France aboard a B-17 named the Argonaut 3. During this mission, again, all was relatively quiet. Poor weather obscured the target and there was brief action in the air, but in this raid of more than 100 B-17s, only one aircraft was lost. Gable made it back safe, completing his second combat mission of the war. Originally, when he had arrived in England, many of the other air crews looked upon Gable disfavorably, as they were in the thick of combat and expected the 40-year-old star to simply be there for publicity. But as they got to know him, Gable quickly earned the respect of the men. He was humble, personable, and truly wanted to contribute as much as he could, especially after the heartbreaking loss of his wife. He was also not afraid of combat and wanted to fly with the men every day. By the late summer, he was right at home and had gained quite a few fans. But at this time, there was one other fan of Clark Gable's that had started to make quite a fuss about the famous actor. This was none other than Adolf Hitler himself. After starring in some of the biggest movies in the 1930s, Hitler had become one of Gable's biggest fans, and according to some historians, it was nearly an obsession. Because of this, at the start of the war, Hitler had issued an order for Gable to be taken and brought to Germany to star in German films for Hitler. But obviously, this did not happen. So, frustrated that he was not able to get his hands on the actor peacefully, after hearing that he was actively serving on board of B-17s, Hitler supposedly told Hermann Goering to place a bounty on Gable if he was able to be shot down and taken alive. Following this command, Goering issued a $5,000 bounty on the American celebrity, more than $100,000 today. And little did Gable know that this offer would very nearly be fulfilled. On July 24th, just two weeks later, Gable would be allowed to fly an additional mission, this time on B-17 Ain't It Gruesome. This would be a mission to Norway, and again a quiet mission as a safe target was no doubt selected for Gable, with just one B-17 lost for more than a hundred. But in this next mission, the easy combat would come to an end. On August 12th of 1943, Gable was approved to go on a mission again with Ain't It Gruesome, but this one would be to Germany, the first major bombing raid to the Ruhr Valley. And unfortunately, the Germans would defend this region well. As the flying fortresses neared their target on this mission, multiple groups became separated in the thick cloud cover. In addition, the flak was heavy and German fighters appeared quickly in full force. 109s poured cannon fire into multiple flying fortresses, and the anti-aircraft was incredibly accurate. Gable recorded fantastic footage of flak exploding right outside of their bomber, and a little while later actually realized that one 20mm flak round had hit the aircraft right where he was standing. The round had gone through the heel of his shoe and continued through the top of the fuselage. Had it exploded, Gable would have surely been killed. In addition, a short while later, a German fighter scored a hit on the bomber, taking out one engine and seriously damaging the aircraft. Ain't It Gruesome was luckily able to make it back to England, but not all of the other planes in their group were so lucky. In this raid, 183 B-17s took part. 23 would be shot down, and three others damaged beyond repair, a loss rate of 14%. 83 men were killed in action, with 49 wounded and 154 taken as POWs. One of the crew members killed was on board of B-17 Ain't It Gruesome with Clark Gable, and two others were seriously wounded. After seeing missions like this, Gable even began to refuse his days off for relaxation, but instead spent the entire time writing letters to the spouses of crew members that had been killed in action. He later recalled, I saw so much death and destruction, I realized that I hadn't been singled out for grief. 
The others were suffering and losing their loved ones just as I had lost mine. This was something that weighed heavily on his mind, and again writing these letters made him even more respected by the men in England. His last official combat mission would be on September 23rd. It is my belief that the commanders likely gave him a little more time off before this next assignment, as he had had such a close call in the last raid in August. One commander even reportedly said, the damn fool insists on being a rear gunner every mission. Know what I think? Gable's trying to get himself killed. Yeah, so he can join up with his wife. On this last mission, he flew with a B-17 named the Duchess to a raid in France. Serving as the nose gunner, he returned safely with minimal action as the target was again obscured by cloud cover. Unfortunately though, around this time, word reached MGM Studios about the intense combat mission over Germany where he was nearly killed. Almost immediately, MGM pressured the Army Air Force to remove their star actor from frontline service. So, in November, he was removed from combat duty and was brought back to the United States, with more than 50,000 feet of color footage from his time as a gunner and a member of the 351st Bomb Group. This footage would be made into the film Combat America in 1945, which serves as a beautiful look into the day-to-day -day life of a B-17 crew member in 1943. Unfortunately, this film was largely overshadowed by another combat film released at almost the exact same time, The Memphis Bell. After the war ended, many of the airmen that served with Clark Gable actually said that the officially recorded missions that he flew on were only a fraction of those that he actually participated in. Apparently, for most of the time that he had been in England, Gable had been going up on extra missions without officially getting approval, desperately wanting to serve his country and fight with the men that he had come to love. This is no doubt the definition of a hero going from the fame of Hollywood to serve in the most dangerous missions of World War II, fighting for freedom. Comment if you think that any actors in Hollywood would do something like this today and please consider subscribing.